Join me along the broken road with the Broken Vessels podcast. Jeremiah 18.4 states, And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. This is the Broken Vessels Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Simpkins. This is a podcast where we have discussions on theological themes for the broken to bring encouragement and hope in Christ. And I would like to welcome you back to Along the Broken Road with the Broken Vessels podcast. As you can probably notice, it doesn't sound like I am along the broken road today. Well, I am not. I am actually in my office at the regular old podcasting board sharing with you today. I just felt like having a discussion on the topic that I'm going to talk about today, or at least kind of ruminating on this particular topic, is very timely and important for many people that have dealt with this topic. The topic that I'm going to talk about today is suicide, and particularly suicide by somebody that we know and love, and somebody that we know is truly a believer and understands the gospel, but yet uh, they have gone to a place of darkness that many of us can't completely comprehend or understand, and they choose to take their life. I've seen this happen several times really in the last year of people that I'm acquainted with or that I have knowledge of that have chosen to take the action of ending their life. And I'm the type of person that I can relate and understand why that person did that. Because I too, as many of you know, if you've listened to the story of my life on this podcast, have tried to end my life in the past when I was going through a very dark time. And it wasn't that I didn't know who Jesus was. It wasn't that I didn't trust Christ. It wasn't that truthfully I wasn't saved. It was just that I was in such a dark place that I really thought ending my life and just going to heaven was going to be better. And many times, you know, people say, well, that's just selfish. Well, yeah, it is, but we're all very selfish at many times in our lives, especially when we're going through darkness and turmoil and we really lose hope. The truth of the matter is, is we are frail. Anybody that's ever been through anything, we have intimate knowledge of the frailty of who we are as Christians. People that have never thought that way, they have a real hard time understanding how somebody can come to that point. I'm not one of those people because I've been to that point and I sympathize with those people. Not only have I been somebody that has been a survivor of having somebody committed suicide that's very close to me, my brother, as I also shared on the episode talking about my life, and gone through the whole gamut of emotions. And not only that, but of blaming myself, of wondering if there was something I could have done to prevent it. But then again, as I've shared before, like that opened a door for me to look at that as an option, as a way out, dealing with my own tumultuous life at the time, and struggling very much so with suicidal ideation for many, many years. And it can just be so hard to fight those notions, especially when you're going through something very dark in your life. And when we see somebody close to us, that it could be anybody from a parent or a sibling and even a pastor, and and you're thinking to yourself, a pastor, why would a pastor do do such a thing? Well, I've heard recently of a very good pastor, a very loving pastor, a pastor who loved many in his congregation and and who helped a lot of people and really understood the gospel, but yet that was a path that he chose to take. And for many, it can be very jarring and very shocking. For even a, a spiritual leader who's not a bad spiritual leader, but a good spiritual leader who's helped us go through very difficult things in our lives, but then to see that he is just as frail as we are. Brothers and sisters, we are all frail. We are but dust. Psalm 103, 
verse 14. He says, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Verse 15, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But here's the good news. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children. God is the one that saves us and blesses us and gives us his peace. He understands that we are but dust. He understands that we have frailties that many people can't fathom, that they can't understand. Whenever I hear about people struggling with depression and despair and suicidal ideation. I think of the old Puritan poet and hymn writer, William Cowper. Many of you know a hymn, a couple of hymns that he wrote, but this one in particular, I guarantee that you've sang this at some point in your life. But he wrote this hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. I think of the last verse. When this poor lisping, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. William Cowper dealt with severe depression, severe anxiety, severe despair. He tried to commit suicide several times in his life, and even after he came to Christ, He still attempted it several times. He was a member of John Newton's church. And John Newton pastored this man and loved him. He didn't condemn him, but he loved him. But even in spite of all of these things, because of the trauma that he had gone through from the loss of siblings, the loss of parents, the severe despair that this man dealt with, he eventually succeeded and he committed suicide, but yet we're able to read his poems of the wondrous love of Christ for us. We're able to sing his song in church on Sunday morning where he talks about the fountain filled with blood that washes away all of our guilty stains. We are all frail and we are but dust. You know, you may have been somebody who has been abandoned by somebody who chose to commit suicide, or you may also be somebody who's dealing with the confusion of it. I'm going to read two liturgies for you today from the book Every Moment Holy, Volume 2, which deals with grief and loss and pain when it comes to death, and particularly these kinds of deaths that bring so much pain and hurt and shock. I just want you to listen to these, and I want you to be comforted by the truth of who God is for us even in the midst. This first one is from page uh, 218 in Every Moment Holy, Volume 2. And this one is a liturgy for those who feel abandoned by one who chose suicide. You know our grieving is far from over, O Lord. You know our healing is incomplete. You know we are not whole. Though the initial shock of loss subsides in time, the aftershocks endure, and we must perpetually reckon the cost, for it is a compounding Arm, tallied across every meaningful moment, good and ill alike, in which we must learn what it means to wrestle anew with the nuances of all these empty spaces. Empty because the one who should have been here to labor, to lament, to console, encourage, or celebrate with us is by their own choice so conspicuously absent. I feel forsaken by one in whom I place great trust, O God. I know a deep loneliness. No other soul can touch like a pit hollowed beneath the foundation of my existence. An ever-present void into which it seems my whole world might crumble. I find it harder now to love and let myself be loved. As my instinct to duck and cover, run and hide, or scratch and fight against the very compassions I need. For fear of letting another near enough to pierce my heart again. And yet I know, if left unchecked, these ripples of reminiscent will eat away all future joy in my life. As surely as the slow workings of rain and rust will flake and crumble iron. For your merciful, tendering work, O Christ, our hearts would finally be hidden beneath impenetrable gnarls of scarred tissue, unable to give and receive again. So let me now... 
And every time such emotions rise, address them before they perform their malignant work. Lead me by your spirit to weed this field of heart and mind and soul, lest it be overgrown and choked of all that is good. I did not choose to be saddled with this long labor of forgiveness, O God, but it is not a work I would neglect. Be now, when I feel most abandoned, the wellspring of all solace, teaching me to trust you better, teaching me to lament, to confess, and to release all bitterness. Let me receive the true comfort of these eternal truths. You, O God, are a loving Father who has never abandoned us children. You, O Jesus, are a faithful bridegroom who laid down his life for his bride. You, O Spirit, are always with us so that we are never forsaken or alone. All that I most deeply need is constantly and faithfully offered in you. You are my refuge and my comfort, even in this. And in your presence, my Lord and my God, I uncover my wounds Express my doubts and fears. Give vent to my frustrations, my disappointments, my anger, my grief. In your presence alone, I can both feel these things and also learn to release them. Like a child folding paper boats and setting them adrift in a swift stream to watch them spin away toward the ocean of your infinite love. Intercede for me, O Christ, in the place of these profound hurts that will not be completely healed in this life, and then the quiet that will follow these questions that have no satisfying resolution. Meet me with your gentle presence. Lead me from here to the place of your peace. Father, by the work of your Spirit, enable me to forgive this person for the pain they have left me to wrestle with in this season. May your great mercy cover them, and all consequences of their choice. I offer to you, O God, these hurts and all other sufferings that the enemy of my soul might intend for evil and harm, so that such wounds would not render me brittle, but rather more supple, as you, a potter, watering and working in soft clay, tenderly fold and smooth such sorrows into the better design of your vessel. Shape me into a reservoir of your glory, your mercy, and your love. Amen. And now, a liturgy for grieving well amidst the confusion of a suicide. O Lord of life, weep with me now, for I grieve a life interrupted by the choice of one who willed to live it no more. I cannot fathom why this has transpired or what they sought to mend by such a final sudden end. Instead of reaching out or hanging on or fighting through despair till hope returned, now we who are left are left with questions for which we have no ready answers, O Christ. How could it come to this? This hurt is more than I can cope with on my own, for it is not just the pain of searing loss, but the added burden of the question, why? That I must wrestle through, perplexed and paralyzed by the shock of a mystery I cannot comprehend. This grief is too complex. It would be far easier to grieve a death from accident or disease than it is to face the weight of this ambiguity. For it is one thing to hate the cancer or the car wreck that robs us of a loved one. But what or whom are we to rage against for this loss, save the one we love and have lost and now grieve? And to this tangled tension... Add the shame of having to explain the way they died, while never wanting those who fear to pass judgment on one whose depth of pain they did not know, whose last despairing choice might have been made as one who leaps from a burning tower to avoid the flames, and who might, even a moment too late, have regretted or repented of that mistake. Oh God, I will forever hate the choice they made, but I will forever love them the same as I did in life. Even in those moments when what I feel most is an anguished rage at their choice, because they were so much more than one tragic act, if only I could turn the clock hands back, I feel as if it were my fault somehow, as if I were the one who failed. I can't escape the sting of regret for hurts I can't unmake 
in words I can't unsay, a swarming litany of self-blame, for I cannot shake the thought that they would not have carried through but for some consequence of what I did or did not do. After all, if I had noticed more, listened more, loved better, wouldn't the one I still love be here? Is their absence itself not ample evidence of my own omissions and sins? Oh God, what I would not give to live those hours again and live them differently. And so I am left with a tangled weave of love and pain and shame and anger and confusion and guilt and defensiveness and regret. An impossible knot I could not spend fruitless ages trying to unravel. As if I could sift the past and find what I was blind to or find something deserving of my anger or even spy some thread of light that runs through this shadow fog, illuminating a deeper, mysterious, hidden purpose in this seemingly senseless loss. But none of this brings any comfort. The tension in my chest does not resolve, and seeking somewhere, I can lay the blame leaves me ever on the verge of lashing out to everyone and everything. There is no simple answer that will ever satisfy Because beneath this desperate search for an answer, all I really want is to see and hold the one I love. To have them here restored again to life. And that one outcome I most desire is the one I am most utterly denied. So if there is any peace to find, it must come from somewhere other than these fruitless revolutions of my mind. It must come from you, O Christ. O most wounded God, bear these my wounds as well. And be at work within them. Take the shattered shards and raw materials of my grief and fashion them into a mosaic of weeping grace, a pattern worked of pain, but also comfort in the pain. Comfort your people, O Christ. Teach us what it means to grieve well amidst this confusion. Teach us how to love despite this anguish by your Spirit. Be at work within our minds and hearts, enabling us to forgive and to forgive, and to forgive, both today and in the days and years to come, to forgive the one who chose to leave us, and to forgive ourselves, and to forgive one another for any failings we perceive. And in that slow release, like the unclenching of a fist, to find that our hope fixed in you is anchored deeper and stronger than any present heartache. For you, O Lord, from the foundation of the world, love this one more deeply and perfectly than we ever will. You created them to reflect your glory, and through that visage, and though that visage is marred in each of us by sin, yet did we catch glimpses of your beauty there in them. In the mysteries of your sovereignty, you allowed them freedom to make a harmful, significant, and irreversible choice just as you grant each of us agency to choose that which might harm ourselves or others. And yet that choice does not negate your great grace, for your grace was ever offered. And your grief, O Christ, at this willful cutting off of life, at this giving in to pain and despair, is greater than our own. For you alone have carried the full weight of it and know the shape and the cry of the heart of the one who chose such a barren path. So we plead and intercede, asking that your mercies eternally cover their sins and our own as well. Remind us, O Christ, both now and in the days to come, that even a tragic end does not upend the good that came before it. This solitary act of pain was but a single line in the story of a lifetime. Our love and friendship were real. And the hope and the joy and the laughter and delight inscribed on those earlier pages remain forever in the larger story, as gloriously true as they ever were. Let us not forget, then, in our present grief, the fixed history of the many graces, so long manifest in and through and to the one whose loss we grieve. Let us over time reawaken to the tender memories of more and more of those good, bright things. 
for such joys are greater collected weight than the one choice made in a moment when the soul was overwhelmed, and that the redemption of all things, those memories for which we are so thankful, will surely prove more eternal than all our present tears. Now into our grief, speak grace, O Father. Into our chaos, speak comfort, O Christ. Into our pain, speak peace, O Spirit. For you alone, O triune God, can sustain our souls and our hopes amidst these crashing swells and reverberations of pain and confusion. Shield and cradle us now and forever in your undying love, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. All our hope is in you. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, suffering the pain of loss of suicide is so very difficult. It's hard. I can remember when my brother committed suicide and the pain and the confusion, the hurt, the asking God, why, 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 God, would you allow this? But at the same time, I understood the depth of pain that he was suffering. I understood why he chose to make that choice, although it was the wrong choice. And then I think of the times when I suffered the darkest, deepest hole of depression and anxiety and pain that I just didn't think I could handle. And I thought, what else can I do? I don't know what else to do. And many people didn't understand why I was struggling in that way at that time. It is a selfish choice, no doubt. But you know what? When you're in that moment and you're thinking in those terms, you actually think that you're doing a service (laughs) to those that you love by ending your life because you feel like you're a burden upon them. That's not true. It's the lies that the enemy brings into our minds. It's the lies of this world. It's us lying to ourselves, trying to think of some way to justify trying to make a choice like that. That person at that moment, when they're making that choice, are confused themselves, and they are weak, and they're hurting, and they're in pain. I don't have any easy answers other than we cast ourselves upon the grace of God. The triune God, just as we just prayed to God just now for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to bring us hope and healing and grace. The other thing that I can say is this, and something that I I saw when I was kind of reading on uh, William Cowper, another thing that was said, it was said of William Cowper about John Newton as he would come and minister to him that he was just loving And he just loved him, and he just spoke the grace of God to him. And that's what we need to do as believers. We we must come to these people, and we must speak the words of life to them and point them to Christ. The, The worst thing that you can do is to somebody that's going through the pain of whatever it is that they're going through is to come and to speak the condemnation of the law to them. Although there is a sense in which if they are not a believer, they, they need that. But they need to, they need to hear the, the words of life of the gospel, that Christ came to die for them, that Christ came to bring them hope and to bring them life and to bring them love. They need to hear comfort, comforting words, words of life, words of truth, but words of life. God is sovereign. He's in control. Nothing that happens in this life is without purpose. And we may not be able to see the purpose of it at this point or in in this life, but God will reveal it eventually, whether in this life or in the life to come. But we can still keep a hope in that God in his sovereign grace is in control and that we can trust him and that he's good, he's gracious, and that he loves us. We cast ourselves upon that grace when we lose someone to the act of suicide. And when we ourselves struggle with that suicidal ideation that creeps into our minds and lies to us and tells us that we'd just be better off dead. Because it's not true. It's not true. The truth is is that (laughs) the people in our lives that we think we're a burden to need us and they love us and they want us here. And that's what you need to focus on, the sanctity of your life and the sanctity of the life of others. This is not an easy subject. It's not an easy topic, but it's one close to my heart. 
And all I can tell you today is that our only hope is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Our only hope, as you're going to hear on Thursday with Mike Abendroth, as as I have him on to talk about gospel assurance, our only hope in life and death is Christ, as the Heidelberg tells us. It's knowing that he, (laughs) he came and lived a perfect life. And he died on a cross for us and took our sins. And he rose again on the third day. And he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding and advocating for us, even in our frailty, our sinfulness, and the hurt and the pain that we're going through, and the brokenness that we face sometimes on a daily basis. Christ is our hope. Look to him today. And for those that are suffering in the pain of the loss of a suicide or those that are suffering right now with thinking that ending their life is going to be better for them and better for everyone else. The best thing that you can do is to come to them with empathy and grace and the healing words of the gospel. Uh, Just uh, to keep you all uh, apprised of uh, this part of the Broken Vessels podcast along the Broken Road with the Broken Vessels podcast that I've been doing every Tuesday. I didn't miss a week uh, last week just because of circumstances, but um, one thing that I'm going to be doing is I'm only going to be doing this uh, installment of the podcast once a month. It'll be the first Tuesday of each month. I will take you along the Broken Road with me to have these kinds of conversations with, with you. So next month, The first Tuesday of June, I'll be bringing you along the broken road again with me. We will just talk about, again, whatever God lays on my heart to talk to you about. I hope that this has been encouraging to you. I hope that it has brought you comfort this morning or this day, whichever time of day you're listening to it, or this evening. It could be in the evening that you're listening to this right now. But I hope and pray by God's grace that it will be encouraging to you. Uh, Join me on Thursday uh, as I have... uh, Pastor Mike Abendroth on the Broken Vessels podcast to talk about his book, Gospel Assurance, and talk about the subject of assurance. We look forward to seeing you then, and we'll see you next month along the Broken Road with the Broken Vessels podcast. (laughs) 